Oh, thank you very much, Mike. I'd like to just introduce Amber Sultane from AARP. Go ahead, Amber. Hello, good morning and welcome everyone. I am Amber Nightingale Sultani with AARP's office in Virginia. I uh, do community outreach in Northern Virginia and uh, I'm here this morning to provide you with a brief welcome message on behalf of AARP. We are thrilled to be collaborating with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University to bring uh, just a sampling of the rich programs that Ali Mason offers on a regular basis. Uh, AARP has been a champion of lifelong learning from our earliest beginnings, and our founder, Dr. Ethel Percy Andrews, once said, quote, the eagerness to learn, to pioneer in the development of new skills and new abilities, to broaden the personal scopes of understanding, to freshen the mind with con new, con new ideas and new concepts, to achieve new heights of knowledge has no age restriction. Uh, that's what she said in the 1950s, and that's as true today as when she said it back then. As studies have shown that challenging your brain in new ways throughout your life may strengthen your brain. Our brain is stimulated and makes new connections when we learn new things or pursue new ideas and interests. So AARP encourages you to stay curious and give yourself a good mental workout by doing something that challenges your brain, offers you enjoyment, and encourages you to grapple with new and complex ideas. So we thank you for joining us this morning. And with that, I'm gonna turn it to Jennifer DeSano, who's the Executive Director of Holly Mason. Jennifer? Thank you so much, Amber. And thank you, Mike, for working out those technical issues. We are looking forward to this lecture. The Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University has been in existence for 30 years. And we serve curious individuals who participate in lectures, clubs, trips, and special events, as well as volunteer opportunities such as teaching and service on committees. There are many things you can learn and do at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University. And I want to welcome all of our Ollie Mason members, as well as, as, well as those of you who are in Virginia and across the United States online through our AARP connection. You can learn more about OLLI at OLLI, O-L-L-I dot G-M-U dot E-D-U. And Mike can put that in the uh, chat so you can reference it later. We're very happy to be collaborating to bring you our wonderful speaker today, Blaine Amthor, is a federal government employee with more than 35 years of service. A Philadelphia native, he has had a lifelong interest in history, particularly World War II, ocean liners, and the American Revolution. Please welcome Lane Amthor. All right. Well, thank you for joining me in this presentation. I hope you'll find it interesting and enlightening. And what I want to do is highlight some famous events that we know on the surface, but to give the details and interesting aspects about them that you may not know. And I wanna dispel some misconceptions regarding some of these events and describe some lesser known ones that were pivotal in the war. And then also to highlight some personalities who seem to be at the center of a lot of the action. Due to its high profile, the Boston massacre can be easily seen as a single spontaneous event. However, it was actually the culmination of a series of protests and clashes. And on the left there, you can see an etching, whoop, I'm sorry, of one of these protests. Now, British troops had occupied Boston since 1768. And from the start, it was an uneasy relationship between citizens and soldiers. Tension had been increasing, ratcheted up by people like Sam Adams, who you see on the lower right. Tory or loyalist publishers, John Mean and John Fleming had been publishing the names of merchants who publicly supported the non-importation agreement, which was the Townsend Acts, but continued importing and stockpiling products to sell when the acts expired. Both men were attacked on the way to their shop and were chased by a crowd of 200. Royal Governor Thomas Hutchinson, who you see on the top right, who violated this agreement himself, had little authority. 
Patriots also began labeling with signs the houses and stores of merchants who would not join their cause. Ebenezer Richard, Richardson was attacked while trying to remove one of these signs. Reaching his house, he shouted at the crowd, be the eternal God, I'll make it too hot for you before the night. Patriot Thomas Knox, in the crowd of people who had chased him, replied, come out, you damn son of a bitch, I'll have your heart out, your liver out. After a, a stone was thrown through the window and struck his wife, Richardson fired his musket into the crowd, striking 11-year-old Christopher Snyder, who died that evening. In a show of propaganda, Patriots organized the largest funeral to date in the colonies with 500 school children marching two by two. Four days after the funeral, citizen John Gray initiated an altercation with British soldier Patrick Walker at Gray's rope making shop. Walker returned with 40 soldiers and the sides beat each other with clubs and wooden slats. Over the next two days, similar events occurred. By March 5th, the day of the massacre, a foot of snow covered Boston and by nightfall, small bands of patriots armed with clubs began patrolling the streets. Around town, there were several clashes between citizens and soldiers. At the Custom House, Private Hugh White was on sentry duty. After Bostonian Edward Garrick accused White's captain of not paying a bill, White struck him with the butt of his musket, followed him and struck him again. When White returned to the sentry box, a crowd gathered around him and began pelting him with snowballs, oyster shells and chunks of ice. And you can see that depicted in this top left painting here. Several citizens, including Henry Knox, tried to, dis to disperse the crowd. The crowd shouted at White, kill him, kill him, fire, damn you, fire. You dare not fire. Sensing violence, some of the crowd of 200 dispersed, leaving about 50 to 80 people. Captain Thomas Preston, in charge of the guard, arrived with additional soldiers. The crowd pressed in and five Boston men were killed and six injured. Who fired the first shot? Who was killed first and how it all happened is still not clear. But it was not over. A crowd of four to 5,000 colonists gathered and all British soldiers were called out. A tense standoff followed, but was diffused by Governor Hutchinson, assuring justice would take place. Ironically, England was about to repeal the Townsend Acts in April but March had, or word had not yet reached Boston. Now there is a marker for the Boston massacre outside the state house, which you can see on the lower left here, this circular stone marker. Okay, but it has never been in the correct location and has been moved several times to accommodate traffic. The custom house, the site where the site of the massacre was, was down the street from the state house. So if you look at this diagram in the lower middle, you can see here this green arrow where the massacre took place outside the custom house, but the marker is down here outside the state house. Paul Revere created what is probably the best known depiction kind of showing the correct location. So if you look at that depiction up top here, you can see the state house in the background. Other depictions contain accurate details, such as soldiers standing in a circle, which you see on the lower right, and snow on the ground, which you see on the top right and the top left. Whereas in Revere's depiction, it's clear, there's clearly no snow on the ground. Now, following the massacre, the British soldiers were jailed and a trial was conducted. When John Adams became part of the defense, rocks were thrown through his house windows and he was jeered on the street. And you see John, John Adams in the top left. 96 depositions were gathered from people who all claimed 
they were on peaceful errands on March 5th. Using inconsistencies in the Patriot depositions and the account of colonist Richard Palms, who was next to Captain Preston when the first shot was fired, Adams created doubt in the jury's mind. Adams' key witness, Dr. John Jeffries, was on the edge of the mob. He stated that he felt the soldiers would have fired long before they did, and that if they had not fired, that they would have been killed since the mob was shouting, kill them. Adams summarized that the law was clear that the soldiers had a right to defend themselves against a mob conducting a riot and threatening them. Captain Preston, who you see at the top here, and six soldiers were found not guilty. Two soldiers were found guilty not of murder, but a lesser charge of manslaughter. They were branded on the hand with the letter M so all would know their guilt and there could be no future commutation. Interestingly, the best known victim, Crispus Attucks, who you see in the lower left, did not become well known until before the Civil War when his death was used as a tool for abolitionists. It was only upon later conflict with England during the revolution that the massacre victims came to be enshrined as martyrs. And you can see one of those um, depictions here of the victims in the lower middle. In a strange coincidence, years later, when Adams was ambassador to the court of St. James in Britain, he recognized Thomas Preston on a London street. Now the victims are buried in the Granary Burying Ground in Boston. And they include that 11-year-old Christopher Snyder, whose name you see here. And that site can be visited. All right, so now we move on to Paul Revere. We know of Paul Revere, but what do we know about him? His father was a silversmith to whom Paul was apprenticed. And his father died when he was 19, leaving him as head of the household. He served as an artillery second lieutenant during the French and Indian War. He built a strong business making silver products for the wealthy and lesser items for the middle class, such as shoe buckles, dog collars, spoons, bracelets, and baptismal basins. Becoming one of the finest craftsmen in the colony, surviving pieces are prized by museums. And you can see two of those displays here in the middle. He expanded into engraving copper plates for illustrations and working with any sort of metal. He had eight children by his first wife who died and eight by his second wife. Only five of his children survived him. He was a patriot joining many community organizations such as the Boston Committee of Correspondents, meeting people such as Sam Adams and John Hancock. He made the famous engraving of the Boston, Ma Boston Massacre that I showed you and helped plan the Boston Tea Party, perhaps participating in it. By 1773, he owned a horse and carried messages to various nearby towns and longer trips to New York and one to Philadelphia to where he carried word of the Boston Tea Party in just 11 days round trip in the wintertime, a sign of a good rider. He was just part of a vast warning network covering several colonies with many riders. His famous ride was an obscure event until the 50th anniversary of independence and the publication of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's famous poem in 1861, which changed parts of the story to be more effective and was used to rouse people to the cause of liberty right before the Civil War. And you see Longfellow there on the right. Interestingly, these two people were linked in that Wadsworth's grandfather, whose name was Peleg, tried to court Marshal Revere over his actions during an attempt in 1779 to free Castine, Maine from the British, and that court martial failed. So the warning network that Revere was a part of 
gave about a two-day warning of the likely British march on Concord. So Revere's where was his ride was not spontaneous. Revere was asked to get word to Sam Adams and John Hancock in Lexington, who had previously fled Boston to avoid being captured by the British. And on this ride, there were three riders involved, Revere, William Dawes, who you see on the lower left, and his ride was planned, and Dr. Samuel Prescott, who you see on the lower middle, whose ride was unplanned. Now, Wadsworth's poem does not mention Dawes or Prescott. Revere informed Robert Newman of Christ Church, later named North Church, of the needed signal two lanterns for a sea crossing by the British. Contrary to impressions, Revere had previously arranged for this signal since there was a two-day warning of the British marching. So it was a two-day warning for the Patriots, not himself, because Revere already knew what was about to happen. Two friends, Thomas Richardson and Joseph, Joshua Bentley rode him across the Charles River. And you see that shown in this painting here on the top left. He then obtained a horse from Deacon John Larkin and started for Lexington about 12 miles away. So Revere rode a borrowed horse, not his own. And it is possible that Larkin's horse was borrowed from his father-in-law. So Revere may have ridden a twice borrowed horse. Spotting two British officers, Revere took another road, alerting nearly every house along the way. And he did not say the British are coming, but said the regulars are coming out. Arriving at Lexington, he alerted Adams and Hancock, and he met Dawes there as planned, and then ran into Prescott, who was returning to his home in Concord and who volunteered to alert people on his way home. Revere volunteered to join Prescott, but was captured by the British, then released. Revere had completed his assignment of, of carrying a warning to Lexington, not Concord, which was not his assigned destination. Some sources state that he did not complete his ride, but he did. However, he still had another job that night, the removal of incriminating papers from Buckman Tavern at Lexington. They contain records of Patriot meetings and activities, especially regarding Adams and Hancock, whom the British sought to arrest. And you can see a Buckman Tavern in the lower middle as it exists today. Revere was crossing Lexington Green with the chest of papers when the fighting began, but continued on completing another assignment that famous night. After the war, he continued his business, but branched into ironworks, establishing his own forge. He began casting bells with his son, making about 400, including one for the USS Constitution. He moved into copper sheathing for ships and supplied it for the Massachusetts State House Dome. Revere Ware, which we may all recognize, and you see in the lower right, introduced by the Revere Brass and Copper Corporation, carries on his name. Its logo, which you see right above the pans there, reflects the year Revere established his copper business, 1801. Now, America attacked Canada? Wasn't all the fighting in the colonies? Well, no, it wasn't. The attacks on Montreal and Quebec were the first major military initiatives by the Continental Army and an attempt to eliminate the threat that the British posed from Canada. The idea to attack Montreal was proposed by General Richard Montgomery. But the second expedition aimed at Quebec was proposed by Benedict Arnold. The Quebec effort was one of the epic undertakings of the war and made a name for Arnold. And you can see on the map there on the left, the Montgomery's expedition up Lake Champlain to Montreal. 
and on the right is Arnold's route to Quebec. To make his maps, Arnold relied on the travel diary of someone interesting, British engineer, Captain John Andre, the man who would help arrange his betrayal years later. Andre had made the map when he accompanied the British down the Kennebec River from Quebec during the French and Indian War. As was common then, two maps were made, one accurate, the other inaccurate for security reasons. Arnold had the wrong map, which lengthened the journey. Arnold left Cambridge, Massachusetts in September 1775 with 1,100 men and arrived at Quebec with 600, covering 400 miles of uncharted land, following the Kennebec River, hauling boats called bateaux over land, and the whitewater rapids of the Chaudière River. And you can see a, a replication of their of these boats called bateau here in the top middle and some sketches of this expedition, especially the one on the right where they had to haul these boats over land. Arnold estimated it would take 20 days to reach Quebec, but it took 51. Leaky boats ruined supplies, equipment and supplies were lost during the freak autumn hurricane and starvation set in with men eating shoe leather and candle wax. Upon arriving outside Quebec, residents were astounded that the force had completed the journey. The American demand for surrender was rejected by British Governor Guy Carleton. Facing the expiration of enlistments at the end of the, of the year, the Americans attacked during the snowstorm on December 31st, 1775, but were soundly defeated due to poor troops illness and the strength of the British position. Arnold suffered the first of two wounds to his left leg. A siege of Quebec followed until May 1776, but was ineffective due to desertions, expiring enlistments and disease, mostly smallpox. When British naval forces arrived, the Americans retreated to Crown Point, New York. The course of Arnold's expedition is outlined by markers like the one you see on the lower right. So as I had mentioned, the British had occupied Boston since 1768. George Washington took command of the American forces in Boston in July, 1775 and occupied Dorchester Heights, but had only a few pieces of artillery to threaten the British fleet in the harbor. British forts Ticonderoga and Crown Point, New York, were captured in May 1775 by Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen. And on the left, top left here, you see Fort Ticonderoga, and the lower left, you see Fort Crown Point. In a plan possibly conceived by Arnold, Henry Knox was selected by Washington to bring the artillery from these forts to Boston and you see a portrait of Knox in the middle. Now, Henry Knox was a bookseller, not a soldier, but had read extensively on military topics, especially artillery. His father-in-law, Thomas Flucker, was the Royal Secretary of Massachusetts. So he was a loyalist, and you see his portrait in the lower right. Though mo most portraits portray Knox as old, in 1775, he was just 25. His brother, William, who would join him on the expedition was 19. Knox's mission was to transport 56 pieces of artillery and supplies from Forts Ticonderoga and Crown Point to Boston on 42 sleds during the winter when snow and cold would allow transportation by sled. His goal was, as he wrote to Washington, to be able to present your excellency a noble train of artillery. This effort would cover 300 miles in 56 days, though Knox hoped it would take 16 to 17 days under the needed cold weather, 
and this was December 1775 through March of 1776. The artillery was moved on Lake Champlain, across land to Lake George, then by land again, aided by a timely two-foot snowfall. A thaw of several days delayed the effort near Albany, but more snow had it moving again. The artillery was placed on Dorchester Heights on March 4th, 1776, though powder and ammunition arrived only several days later. So initially it was a bluff, but the British left Boston on March 17th, never to return, taking some loyalists, including Knox's in-laws. Though depicted in paintings as a single caravan of artillery, the pieces moved in groups. Portraits of this expedition invariably depict the sleds being pulled by oxen, which you can see in the two paintings on the left. However, based on Knox's diary, horses were primarily used with a few oxen added along the way when available. So this mistake in the portraits is likely due to Knox writing to Washington with the intention of using oxen before he could obtain them. According to Knox's diary, while negotiating for the animals, a merchant quoted a very high price. So basically he was price gouging Knox. Knox's use of horses was likely his original plan until the possibility of oxen entered the picture. Knox submitted expenses for 520 pounds, a low cost to secure Boston. In 1926, 1926, the 150th anniversary of Knox's march, New York and Massachusetts erected 59 historical markers that traced the route of the expedition. And you can see one of those markers on the top right. Historian Victor Brooks has called Knox's exploit of moving the artillery one of the most stupendous feats of logistics of the entire Revolutionary War. Knox also arranged Washington's crossings of the Delaware and commanded the artillery at Yorktown. In 1782, he became the youngest major general and was the second Secretary of War. There was a stamp issued for him and 14 places in the US are named for him. Author Washington Irving in his work, Life of George Washington, described Knox as one of those providential characters which spring up in emergencies as if they were formed by and for the occasion. Now, if you look on the lower right, an enterprising person has used Knox and his expedition as a basis for a moving company magnet. Now we know the Declaration of Independence, but do we really know what happened? In August, 1775, a Royal Proclamation stated that the American colonies were engaged in open and avowed rebellion. That's pretty strong language. The Lee Resolution, on June 7th, 1776, stated that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. And this was the clearest call for independence. On June 11th, Congress appointed a committee of five to draft a declaration stating the case for independence. And you can see that committee of five on the top left consisting of John Adams from Massachusetts, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Robert Livingston of New York, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, and Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania. Now, committee members convinced Jefferson to draft it, which is nicely and comically portrayed in the musical 1776. Adams and Franklin made adjustments to Jefferson's text, which was then presented to Congress, which is portrayed in this famous painting in the lower middle. On July 2nd, the Lee Resolution for Independence was adopted by Congress. So this was, this was the actual vote for independence. 
John Adams wrote that he believed July 2nd was the date that would be celebrated as the Great Anniversary Festival. On July 3rd and the morning of July 4th, the declaration document was revised, but remained pretty much as drafted. On July 4th, the re revised version was adopted, which is why it reads in Congress July 4th, which you can see on the top right. So the declaration was not passed or signed on July 4th. So what happened after July 4th? Well, it turns out quite a bit. The Committee of Five was not finished. It was also responsible for printing the document. This job fell to John Dunlap, official printer to the Congress. And you see his portrait on the top left. It is not known how many copies Dunlap printed on the night of July 4th. There are 26 copies known to exist of what is called the Dunlap broadside. Now these are a typeset copy, not handwritten and do not contain any signatures. And you can see an example of that on the top right. Now these 26 copies, 21 are owned by American institutions two by British institutions and three by private owners. On July 19th, Congress ordered the document to be engrossed, which is recording it in a large, clear hand. It was likely done by Timothy Matlack, who had assisted Charles Thompson, Secretary of the Congress. And you see Charles Thompson here on the top right. So why, so he finished engrossing it on August 2nd, which is the date that was fixed for the declaration to be signed. So it was not signed on July 4th, but on August 2nd. And why did the men sign where they did? Well, the signatures, as you can see at the bottom, were arranged geographically. Eventually, 56 delegates signed it with five signing later and two never signing it. And those two who never signed it were John Dickinson of Pennsylvania, who hoped for reconciliation with Britain, and Robert Livingston, who was one of the Committee of Five charged with drafting the document, who felt the declaration was premature. The declaration likely traveled with Congress to Philadelphia, Baltimore, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, York, Pennsylvania, Princeton, New Jersey, Annapolis, Trenton, New Jersey, and New York City before arriving in DC in 1800 in the nation's new capital, where it was housed in several buildings. Years later, the newly created Secretary of State was charged with the preservation of all records. Appropriately, the declaration returned to the first Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, the man who drafted it. Pretty neat. In 1814, when the British attacked DC during the War of 1812, it was moved to an unused grist mill in Virginia, two miles from Georgetown, then to Leesburg before returning to DC, except for the 1876 centennial in Philadelphia. And during World War II, it has been in DC. The document began to age and fade due to being rolled and unrolled, as well as press copies possibly being made where a sheet of paper is pressed on it until some of the ink is transferred. And if you look in the lower middle, you can see how faded the document is. And that little picture to the right here, you can see what on the bottom, what the portion of John Hancock's signature and the wording above it should look like, and above that, you can see what it actually looks like. From 1841 to 1876, it was displayed in the patent office, exposed to sunlight for easy viewing and subject to various temperatures and humidity levels. Several writers noted the deterioration, such as United States Magazine in 1856 saying, that old looking paper with the fading ink. And in 1873, the historical magazine published an official statement by Mortimer Leggett 
Commissioner of Patents, who admitted that many of the names to the declaration are already illegible. In 1877, it was placed in the State Department Library where smoking was allowed and there was a fireplace nearby. And you can see on the top left where the declaration was housed there. However, it was safer there considering that the patent office building was gutted by a fire within a few months of the declaration being moved out of it. From 1924 to 1941, it was displayed in a proper case at the Library of Congress, which you see in the top middle photo. In 1941, it was moved to Fort Knox for safety during World War II. And you can see the declaration being packaged for shipment to Fort Knox in the top right photo. In 1944, it was returned to Library of Congress until 1952 when it was moved to its present location at the National Archives Building. Right. Well, we all recognize the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, but, do we, but what do we know about it? Well, it was created by a German painter, Emanuel Lutz, who you see on the lower right. Born in Germany, his family emigrated to the US when he was 10. He returned to Germany to study painting. The purpose of the painting was to capture the spirit of liberty through the American Revolution and to inspire German freedom. It was not meant to be accurate, but to be inspirational. Lutz began painting it in 1849, but it was destroyed by a fire in 1850. He repaired it was damaged by a fire rather than destroyed. He repaired the damage, but it was destroyed in the 1942 British air raid during World War II. Lutz had created a copy of the painting, and this is the one that survives. Now there's several inaccuracies in the painting, such as the flag did not exist until six months after the event. State or military unit flags were typical. And the boats are wrong, and I'll describe those in a little bit. It appears to be day, but the crossing took place at night. And the Delaware was forming new ice, so there were no chunks of ice, as you can see in the painting here. And the river is wider than the actual point of the crossing. Lieutenant James Monroe right here behind Washington is the only other person standing. However, Monroe did not cross with Washington, but with the Virginia 3rd Regiment in another section of the crossing. Now the painting toured major cities of the US in the early 1850s, drawing huge crowds. It was exhibited in New York City in 1851 and purchased for $10,000, a huge sum at the time. Other authorized copies are displayed at Purdue University, at Washington Crossing Historic Park, and the White House. And the painting has been at the New York City Metropolitan Museum of Art since 1897, and you can see that in the top right. So we know Washington crossed the Delaware, but why did he cross the river and how did it actually happen? By the end of 1776, the Continental Army had suffered a series of defeats in New York and had been chased by the British across New Jersey. When Washington reached the Delaware River, his force had been reduced to four to 6,000 men, 1,700 of whom were unfit for duty. The army crossed into Pennsylvania on December 2nd, 1776. Washington also faced desertions and the expiration of enlistments at the end of the year. On December 20th, the arrival of additional troops from the Hudson River Valley and from Morristown, New Jersey, improved his force. And I want you to remember the arrival of the additional troops from the Hudson River Valley, because that's going to come up a little bit later. The British, confident the Americans were nearly beaten, 
retreated to winter quarters at a chain of outposts across New Jersey, including Trenton and Princeton. Washington sought some sort of bold action to improve the situation and considered attacking the British at Mount Holly, New Jersey. However, intelligence led him to abandon this plan, but a diversion at nearby Iron Hill Works took place to draw some Hessian troops south, placing them out of range for his attack on Trenton. His final plan called for four crossings at Dunks Ferry to create a diversion to the south, at Trenton Ferry to hold Assenpunk Creek Bridge to the south of Trenton to prevent a British escape, and the main crossing at McConkie's Ferry, just north of Trenton. The other crossings did not occur due to the extreme weather and lack of troops. Now the boats that were actually used to transport the troops were called Durham boats, and you can see photos of those on the two left pictures here. The top one there, taken during the annual reenactment of the crossing, and the bottom one here actually in the shed where one of them is stored. So these boats were actually cargo vessels, and they were rowed using huge oars, which you see here, in the bottom center, again, taken during the reenactment. And the troops did not sit as depicted in the painting, but they stood. And you can see them standing here on the top left. Barges were also used to transport artillery, horses, supplies, and additional troops. And that's depicted in this painting on the top right. Now, if you look here on the lower right, this 1960s era bridge, which is at Washington Crossing Park across the river, when friends and I were there several years ago, touring the area, the park ranger that showed us the park said he likes to ask the question of tourists, why didn't Washington just use the bridge to cross the river? And he asked that question to see what kind of reaction he gets from the tourists. Washington's plan was bold, daring, and called for complex coordination a high goal for the inexperienced and exhausted troops during a bad winter storm. And you can see his plan on the map on the left. Washington crossed, his forces crossed here and marched about 10 to 12 miles to Trenton. And along the way they split so they could attack Trenton from two sides. The Hessian commander at Trenton, Colonel Rawl, had warnings of the attack and disregarded instructions from British General Howe to dig in. Responding to General Howe, let them come. We'll at them with the bayonet. The logistics of the crossing were given to Henry Knox. Remember him? Who had hauled the cannons from Fort Ticonderoga a year earlier. Now the weather worsened during the day. Freezing rain changed to sleet then to snow in what was a nor'easter storm. And some soldiers marched the 10 to 12 miles to Trenton barefoot while others wrapped rags around their feet. So stories of leaving trails of blood in the snow were true here and at other times during the war. And you can see a painting of the march here on the top right. As the crossing and march fell behind schedule, Washington considered calling it off. And a misconception is of Hessian Colonel Rawl, of sleeping in and not reacting to the attack. The truth is that he organized his troops, fought bravely, was wounded, and died 30 hours later. Another misconception is that Hessians were drunk and sleeping in after celebrating Christmas Day. The truth is that they responded quickly to the attack and fought well. Trenton was a 90-minute battle with 23 dead Hessians and four Americans wounded. After the battle, Washington crossed back into Pennsylvania, a crossing made more difficult due to 1,000 prisoners captured horses, cannon, weapons, and supplies, 
and some American troops drunk, drunk on captured rum. So it was some Americans who were drunk, not the Hessians. On December 29th, Washington recrossed the river, this time at eight points to join a force which had crossed two days later to repulse the expected British counterattack from Princeton. A recent snow followed by bitter cold allowed some troops to walk across a frozen Delaware River. So if you were counting, in the end, Washington crossed the Delaware, not once, but four times. Now on to Benedict Arnold. And you look at that title and you think America's greatest soldier. What, what is that about? Well, the general impression of Arnold is of a dastardly traitor, but there is much more to his story that may change your view. His great grandfather had succeeded Roger Williams as president of the Rhode Island colony. He was fearless. As a teenager, he challenged a local sheriff to a fist fight and later engaged in multiple duels. He made his money by running a general store and like many contemporaries, by smuggling. He acquired a partnership in merchant vessels and sailed the East Coast and to the Caribbean. This is when he gained valuable sailing experience that would play a significant role later. Washington considered him as fighting general Contemporaries called him America's Hannibal for his extraordinary journey to Quebec in 1775. British Secretary of State Lord Germain described Arnold as the most enterprising and dangerous of all the American generals. He was twice wounded in his left leg, first at Quebec, then at Saratoga. And you see on the right a depiction of him being wounded during the attack on Quebec. Feeling that he did not get the recognition he deserved, he resigned from the army in 1777, <clears throat> but rejoined later that year in time to contribute, contribute significantly to the American victory at Saratoga. Near the Saratoga battlefield is a statue commemorating his leg, but it does not mention his name or show his body. So you can see that statue here in the middle. His wounds, which left him with a permanent limp and his left leg two inches shorter than the other, rendered him unable to serve any longer. So he was appointed military governor of Philadelphia where his loyalties began to change. Ironically, he lived in the same house used by British General Howe during the British occupation of Philadelphia. He used his position for personal profit and married the daughter, Peggy Shippen, of a suspected loyalist. His first wife, also named Margaret, had died a year earlier. Arnold was court-martialed in December 1780 on 13 counts of misbehavior, but acquitted of all but two minor charges. Debt and resentment at not being promoted by Congress led to his betrayal by planning to hand over the plans for the fort at West Point, New York, in exchange for a British command and money of which he never received the full amount. After the failed attempt, Arnold escaped on a British ship appropriately named HMS Vulture. And you see in the top left sketch there, Arnold coming aboard that ship. After Arnold's betrayal, residents of Philadelphia paraded a two-faced effigy of him down the streets. Newspapers compared him to Lucifer and Judas. And the Continental Congress passed a resolution permanently erasing his name from the Army Register. And that top center photo there, you see that's the effigy, two-faced effigy that was paraded through the streets of Philadelphia. After the defection, Washington implemented a plan to capture Arnold and make a public example of him. The plan nearly succeeded, but on the night it was to occur, Arnold was called away to serve in another unit. 
While in the British Army, he fought in several minor engagements. He lived the rest of his life in England, which was ambivalent to him. The British viewed him as a mercenary and responsible for the death of the heroic Major John Andre. Five of his sons served as officers in the British Army. He was buried without military honors. His grave is located at St. Mary's of Battersea Church in London, adjacent to a child care center. So you see that church, St. Mary's of Battersea on the lower left and the lower middle here, you see the crypt with Benedict Arnold, his wife, and one of their daughters next to child care center. There's a fish tank here and there's these, looks like these pictures that kids created, kind of a strange setup. Despite this apparent disregard, there is a stained glass window dedicated to him in the church. You can see that over here, quite elaborate. A plaque to Arnold at the old cadet chapel at West Point where names of Revolutionary War generals are displayed has his name removed. And you can see that on the top, it simply says Major General. Arnold provided perspective on his situation. At Saratoga, when shot in the same leg as at Quebec, an officer, Henry Dearborn, asks where he's been shot. Arnold responded, in the leg, but adds, I wish it had been my heart. Now we move on to the Battle of Valcour Island. Little known, it was one of the first naval engagements of the war by the Americans and took place in October, 1776. It was one of the truly decisive battles of the war, likely saving the American cause. In 1776, the British sought to divide the colonies along the Hudson River by attacking from the north and the south and meeting at Albany. And you can see here a map on the left, Lake Champlain here and the British wanted to come down from the north and meet with a Southern force here at Albany. Benedict Arnold, having retreated from Quebec to Fort Ticonderoga earlier in the year, was charged with building a fleet to stop the coming British attack down Lake Champlain. So Arnold can be considered the true father of the American Navy since he built the first fleet at Skeensboro, currently Whitehall, New York, which itself can be regarded as the birthplace of the American Navy. And there's a plaque there saying that. The Americans had to recruit blacksmiths, shipwrights, loggers, crews, pretty much all the skills needed to build a fleet in the wilderness. Arnold built a fleet of 16 ships. The British built 25 ships at St. John, Canada. Included in Arnold's fleet was the first American warship named Enterprise. And the ninth ship with that name is currently being built. With the approach of winter and the traditional seasonal ending of military campaigning, Arnold realized all he had to do was delay the British in order to foil their plan. Arnold hid his fleet, manned mostly by soldiers, not sailors, on the west side of Valcour Island, forcing the British to fight in a confined area and come at him against the wind. So you can see here this, map in the top middle, the red arrows and the red ships are the British and Arnold's fleet was here in the blue. And on the lower left is an aerial view of Valcour Island and this red arrow indicates the direction of the British fleet and this blue box shows Arnold's location with his fleet. The battle, which was a slugfest, lasted from late morning until dusk ending only when the British had nearly run out, out of ammunition and night had arrived. If you look at these paintings on the right side, those are two paintings depicting this battle. The remaining American ships escaped at night, aided by a providential fog and a moonless night, slipping past the British ships using muffled oars. 
A two-day running battle began as the British pursued the escaping American ships. The remaining American ships reached Ferris Bay where they were stripped and burned. Ferris Bay, which you see right here on the map, was renamed Arnold Bay and is the only place in America named for him. Arnold's men then marched to Fort Crown Point, burned it, then marched to Fort Ticonderoga. When British Governor Guy Carleton reached Crown Point, it had begun to snow and he retreated to Canada for the winter. Had the British been able to continue south, it would likely have been the end of the war. The battle had several huge implications. It forced the British to retreat to Canada for the winter, provi providing a full year's respite for the Americans until their victory at the Battle of Saratoga 11 months later in September 1777. It allowed the Americans to organize and increase the army size in the area. And it removed the British threat to Fort Ticonderoga, allowing 2,000 troops to be sent to General Washington, which were used in the Christmas Day strike at Trenton. So this is these are the troops that I previously referred to who had arrived from the Hudson Valley to assist General Washington in that Christmas Day strike. Arnold was the first commander of an American fleet, but is likely not recognized as such because he was a traitor, which was the big reason. He was defeated in the battle, and the battle took place on the lake, not the open ocean, so it wasn't as grand a setting. The story of Valcour Island did not end when the battle was finished. Many of the ships sunk in the battle remain on the lake bottom, preserved by the cold water. The most famous one is the gunboat Philadelphia, currently at the Smithsonian's Museum of American History. You see that on the top left. In 1935, Colonel Lorenzo Hagelin, a World War I veteran and later a Marine engineer, located and salvaged the Philadelphia. And you see that taking place in this top center photograph. Hagelin and later his widow tried to find a home for the gunboat, but were turned down by Fort Ticonderoga, the Navy Department, the Army Department, and the city of Philadelphia. Mrs. Hagelin gifted this ship in her will to the Smithsonian who accepted it in 1960. And if you look at the top right photo here, you see the gunboat being loaded into the Smithsonian Museum of American History, which is under still under construction there. A replica of the gunboat is on display at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. And you see that in a photo on the lower left. Now, three years before finding the Philadelphia, Hagelin found and salvaged the American ship Royal Savage, which you see in this sketch in the lower middle. It was sold to the city of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1996 by Hagelin's son. Since 2015, it has been at the Naval History and Heritage Command's Laboratory at the Washington Navy Yard. In 1997, the gunboat Spitfire was located and is in pristine condition, still on the bottom of the lake. And you can see a painting of that on the lower right. Now, if you look at the top left photo, most people are familiar with the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National Cemetery, which has soldiers from World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. However, there are similar memorial, memorials for the soldiers of the Revolutionary War. And if you look at the photo in the middle, that's the tomb of the unknown soldier of the Revolutionary War located in Washington Square in Philadelphia, just a few blocks from Independence Hall. And this memorial was completed in 1957. And if we move over to the top right photo, 
That's a memorial at the Old Presbyterian Meeting House burial ground in Alexandria, Virginia. And this was completed in 1929. And if we go to the lower left, that's the tomb of the unknown Revolutionary War soldiers in Rome, New York. Bodies were found while excavating sewer and telephone lines. And it turns out the bodies were those who served at Fort Stanwix during the Revolutionary War. And this memorial was dedicated in 1976. And on the lower right is the Tomb of the Unknown Patriot in Boulevard, Ohio, which is south of Cleveland. And this is located at Fort Lawrence, the only Revolutionary War for fort in Ohio. And this opened in 1917. Though the Revolutionary War and the American Revolution are core to our nation's founding, many of the events composing them are not understood or even known. Though we may need to search a bit to find them, we should be grateful that many reminders of these momentous events still exist as a way to recognize the extraordinary people and events which changed the course of history. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. I hope you found it enjoyable and perhaps enlightening. So now, if anybody has any questions, I will attempt to answer them for you. You know, over the years, primarily in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were several efforts to kind of repair and destroy it, and or not destroy it, restore it. Um, but there's really, um, it's really difficult to do. And, and one of the instances where they actually repaired it was during the movement of it from D.C. to Fort Knox, a corner of it was actually torn off. And so they still had the corner that came off and they restored that once it returned to D.C. near the end of World War II. So they professionally did that or um, by archivists. But um, yeah, there were several efforts to do it, but right now it's, you know, in the case that it's in which it's displayed, it's really in a setting where there won't be or should not be any more damage to it. So I guess one of those perhaps philosophical issues where you just kind of leave it as is. Okay. Uh, Sarah Wines uh, asks, was the battle at Lake Champlain more, less, or equally decisive as the Battle of Cowpens? Well, it was kind of, uh, ooh, that's a really good question. I would say probably about equal, but different um, settings. Obviously, one was a naval battle, the other was a land battle. But I think for the first half of the Revolutionary War, the Valcour Island was probably the decisive battle or one of the decisive battles, whereas Calpins was for the second half of the Revolutionary War and a different, affected a different British strategy of the Southern campaign where they were trying to capture and dominate the Southern states in a move to force an American surrender, whereas Valcour Island took place during the phase of the war when the British were trying to split the northern colonies, basically, where the rebellion had begun. So it's kind of, yeah, equal importance, I would say, but different parts of the war and different settings. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, can you, uh, Alan Wyman writes, uh, can you discuss how the American Revolution almost started at Salem in February 1775? Oh, boy. Um, no, I didn't really don't have uh, much information on that. <laughs> Interesting question. Uh, Alan Wyman also asks, uh, do you think that Peggy Shippen was a co-conspirator with Benedict Arnold? Well, 
Uh, yeah, there's, so there's two schools of thought on that. One is that, yes, she absolutely was and kind of was the brains behind the operation. And the other school of thought is uh, probably a bit, but maybe a stronger role. So, um, you know, the documentation is a bit mixed on it, but it's probably falls somewhere in the middle where she did not, you know, discourage it or was also, uh, but she was corresponding with uh, Major John Andre and some others about um, kind of Arnold's discontent. So certainly you can picture her as, you know, perhaps encouraging him or saying, hey, you know, you've been wrong. Maybe we should do something about this. Um, so it's, I, from what I've read, I tend to think it kind of falls in the middle. She probably encouraged it a bit, but perhaps was not as strong an influence or all the brains behind it as some accounts depict. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Alan Wyman also asks, uh, who was Prince Estabrook at Lexington? Mm, okay, I don't know that. Can he, can he say? <laughs> uh, okay, he would have to have a hand raised. I don't see him. Oh, there, let's see. Oh, he did have a hand raised, but put it back down. So, Mr. Wyman, if you would like to uh, pose a question, go ahead. Prince Estabrook was a young Afro-American gentleman at Lexington who helped uh, remove some of the documents for uh, Adams uh, and uh, Hancock. And, and I should say, yeah, at uh, Lexington before the uh, battle there. Okay. And there's actually a plaque there at Lexington uh, posted okay. there today for him. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Another person asks, uh, is it fair to compare the patriots and politics of the American Revolution to today's standards? Oh, geez. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I would say yes and no. But I mean, the setting, to me, you know, this is my opinion, the setting during the patriot period was... Um, Certainly different than today, where the the uh, standards kind of were different. So uh, it was for the American independence movement that had that was a, a novel idea, especially breaking away from Britain and starting a new country where the people governed themselves basically so that was an entirely new concept and uh they weren't sure how to do it they had ideas so i think um but i think that notion of independence and individuality and um self-government continues today and so there's all and there's always i think been some kind of tension, friction, build into that, that notion where it's not always going to go according to plan or be perfectly peaceful. So, yeah, so I would say there's some similarities, but again, you're comparing different eras where expectations were a bit different. Okay, thank you. Uh Don Pinckney asks, uh, which photo represents the tomb of the unknown soldier that's located in Philadelphia? Oh, it's the one in the center, the large one with the statue of Washington. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah Wines writes, uh, 
do you have more details on Paul Revere's father and who he handled and how he handled uh, his own views vis-a-vis -vis his sons? Well, uh, he, he was actually a French Huguenot whose name was Apollos Revoir, I believe. And so when he came to the U.S., he actually changed his name to Revere, to be, to Paul Revere, to be, to appear more American. And so he was um, also, as I mentioned, a silversmith. So Paul Revere, the son, was fortunate to be apprenticed within the home. And Revere's father died when Paul Revere was 19. So Paul Revere kind of became the head of the family at that age. Uh, but in terms of his political views, I think he was not that much as out there on it, but I think he was probably maybe not as fiercely involved as Paul Revere was, but certainly uh, of the independence mind or self-governing mind. Yes. All right, uh, Juan Perez asks, uh, I understand the French and Spanish military helped the colonial army. Did they yeah. participate in any of the battles you described today or was it in other locations? Well, a lot, well I mean, the famous involvement of the French is at um, Yorktown and they were actually in Connecticut and Rhode Island, where they fought as well against the British. So they, um, but they were involved a bit in the Battle of Saratoga as well. And it was really at Saratoga or after the battle concluded with the American victory that really convinced the French to officially come out and support of the US or of the colonies, if you will, and to provide soldiers and supplies in greater supply or in greater quantities than they had been doing. So they'd been supplying all along and providing guidance. And, you know, a big, a good example would be uh, Marquis de Lafayette, even though he volunteered, he was French, but he came here and participated really almost from the beginning through the end of the war. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Tina in Virginia asks, uh, did the French and Indian Wars play a role in the American versus British conflict? I see similar geographic areas. Uh, yeah, so they were, er there were, yeah, several geographic areas that were fought over and were viewed as in a future areas um, for the United States to expand. And so they were very, um, it's, uh, what's that? I don't want to say controversial maybe or contentious, but they were areas that people realized that there would have to be some settlement or agreement on who was going to essentially own that land, own those areas. So uh, so the French and Indian War really left you know, the British in charge of many of the areas. And so, uh, like especially what they call the Western area, so west of the Alleghenies, were areas where they had to really decide, okay, is this American or British and are we going? And we're willing to fight over it. And um, many of the American army personnel gained ex valuable military experience during the French and Indian War fighting for the British. So including George Washington. Go yes. ahead. And, yeah, go ahead, sir. I got got the, the note to unmute. Yes, I'm uh, wondering if you can examine you know maybe put some perspective on why is it that uh benedict arnold continues to be so vilified and castigated uh 
even in our history books, uh, considering that he was the greatest, as you said, the best leader and soldier that the uh, uh, Continental Har Army had at that time. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, very interesting topic. Um, I I think it's because it's just a simple association with Arnold and betrayal that again, you know, like I said in the introduction to today, we kind of know a lot of these events just on the surface. Or if if you say to somebody Benedict Arnold, the first thing they think of is traitor. And that's all they know because they may have forgotten other things or in school, there's not enough time to go into depth about him and other topics. So, but he was, as you point out, quite accomplished and uh, highly regarded and it had some remarkable achievements throughout the war. So, yeah, I think it's just a general lack of knowledge education, curiosity, and lack of time to really delve into him. But there's a um, fair amount written about him. And even if you have, if you take a look at that statue at Saratoga or his name being erased from the military register by Congress, I mean, that, you know, has a pretty big impact. And you see those kind of like that statue at Saratoga, it's just like, well, it's not really, <laughs> not a positive depiction, even though if you don't know whose leg that is, you, um, even if you do know whose leg that is, it's not a positive depiction. There's a uh, question that came in from our YouTube link. Uh, someone asking, can you recommend any good books that cover the Revolutionary War? Ooh, boy. Um, <clears throat> well, there's several. I mean, if you want the uh, good history of the Southern campaign, there's something called the Road to Guilford Courthouse, which is quite good. Um, there's, I mean, a lot of the books I'm familiar with and I have are kind of more deep or address specific aspects of the war. So like Washington's Immortals is another good book regarding his uh, kind of his personal security detail, but it, you know, throughout the, they, they were with him throughout the war. Um, there's uh, Valley Forge actually by Newt Gingrich, which is well done. And I think there's a book, yeah, there's a book by David McCullough whose title escapes me now, but he covers a range of the war as well. So David McCullough is that famous author, um, voice on many uh, documentaries. I'm always happy to do it. So I'm glad that this is the first time I've had AARP involved. So great to have everybody. <laughs> 